Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today, we're very lucky to be joined by Carl Shriver, who's come down to us from uh, Lockheed Martin in Palo Alto. Uh, Carl did uh, his uh, PhD at the University of Utrecht uh, in the Netherlands on uh, solar and stellar magnetic activity, uh, and then did postdocs at uh, UC Boulder and at uh, ESA, the ESA, uh, and then a, did a fellowship at the Royal Netherlands uh, Astro uh, Academy for Sciences, um, and uh, before coming across to uh, the United States to be a, become a senior fellow at the Lockheed Martin Advanced Technology Center in Palo Alto. Uh, Carl's uh, career has focused around magne magnetic activity in the sun um, and solar type stars. He's interested in uh, coupling of the sun's magnetic field uh, to the uh, heliosphere and to uh, the sun's solar solar wind. Uh, he's also interested in the impact of the sun's variability on society. Um, he has uh, been a uh, science lead in uh, the PI on the uh, TRACE uh, uh, mission, uh, the Transition Region and Coronal Explorer, and the uh, Atmospheric Imaging Assembly on the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Uh, he's a co-I on uh, the HMI instrument, on, on also on SDO. Uh, and also on the uh, forthcoming Interface Region Imaging Spectrograph mission. Um, so uh, I'm sure we're going to hear uh, and see a lot of uh, great images from those missions. So please join me in welcoming Carl. All right. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, there are many reasons why we want to look at the sun. <laughs> I'll just name two. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's the nearest star. It's really the only star that we can see in any detail in the sky. So anything that happens out there in the universe, we hope to see counterexamples of on this star so we can better understand what we're looking at when we're just seeing points in the dark sky. The second is we actually live next to this star and we live in the atmosphere of this star. There's a continuous outflow that runs out at three to 400 kilometers per second, uh, pretty fast from the sun. It takes two to four days from anything that leaves the sun to come towards the earth and it triggers all of the things that we now know under the term of space weather. Now I'm not going to talk about space weather per se, I'm going to talk about what causes space weather and what, what we're learning about this and how we can learn about this with our current instruments and our current uh, computational capabilities. Now it's easy for me to slip into jargon so I, I'll try to define my terms. If I don't just raise your hand because if you have a question about it I bet many others in the audience will have that same question, so I'd rather explain the term properly. I'll try to do that as I go along. I'll start with um, a general introduction into what the sun is and why we're interested in the magnetic field of the sun and how we're learning about it. And then the second half of my talk really is about the new lessons that we're learning, that uh, we have wonderful new observational capabilities, what are they telling us? Well, for one, we can, we can currently see, in fact, uh, all the way down into the Sun. We use seismic waves, just as we do seismology on Earth, to measure not just the structure of what sits inside the Sun, but also the dynamics. We can actually measure the, the wind flows. There's nothing solid in the Sun. It's all gas, uh, ionized gas. Um, and we can measure with these waves the internal dynamics of it. And that's the seat of the solar dynamo that generates the magnetic field. Now, I'll, I'll just touch on the interior. My, my talk will be primarily on the exterior because we actually know a lot more. I just wanted to make sure that you understood that that's where everything happens and that we can sort of probe the structure and the wind speeds, but we cannot see the details of the flows. We cannot measure the presence of the magnetic field. So we have to infer that from whatever happens on the surface and beyond into the heliosphere. We have had for a long time, obviously, visible light observations. Uh, visible light observations that show us structures like sunspots, in which case here on the screen there's only one. Uh, those we've known the existence of really since about 400 years ago. I'll show you some of that. And it is with sunspots and all of the magnetic fields around it that all of that activity in the atmosphere is associated. Now, when I talk about the atmosphere, I'm going to probably use three terms. There's the surface itself, which is the photosphere, from which the light es escapes. That's what defines the name photosphere. Its thickness is of the order of about 50 kilometers, 70 kilometers, compared to 700,000 kilometers of the sun's radius. That means, effectively, it's like the Earth's atmosphere to scale. It's a, a couple of kilometers over a 7,000 kilometer radius. So, in, in, in a sense, if you look at the, the sphere of the Earth from the, from, from, from the moon, you'll see 
hardly any sign of the atmosphere. It looks like a solid globe. The sun looks exactly the same, but it isn't, of course. It's a gas. Right above the atmosphere is where the mystery begins. This is why we want to understand what's happening. The temperature doesn't go down, as you would expect. The temperature goes up. So there's a layer that's 10,000 kelvins or thereabouts. That's the hardest layer for us to explore, which is why I won't say too much about it. Um, it's hard because it's partially transparent. It's partially dominated by the magnetic field. It, it's partially ionized. Um, all the processes and all the complexity that you can think of about occurring somewhere in the universe actually happen in that layer which we call the chromosphere after color. It's the red layer that you see during a complete eclipse. Above it is what we call the corona. That's also a difficult layer, but it's completely transparent. It's pretty much completely dominated by the magnetic field, and it's completely ionized. So there's no neutral hydrogen, no neutral helium anymore. When you're talking about observations of the solar corona, we're basically looking at heavy, ele heavy elements like iron that have just a few electrons left. So most of the images that I'm going to show you are actually taken in light of iron, but they tell us where the rest of the stuff is. It's still there, it just doesn't glow as brightly. So we have instruments now that can take us through these layers. Basically what we do is we tune it to a wavelength and that wavelength picks up the light of a particular temperature. And the particular temperature images we can reconstruct. We can observe them side by side, very nearly simultaneously. So if I run through them very quickly, the near surface layers still look pretty familiar. And then the sun becomes more and more extended. So now we're looking into the layers that actually are a few million degrees in temperature. You see a completely different atmosphere. It's not a sphere anymore. And as we're going through wave, is there some depth uh, thing we should be understanding with all the common layers? I'll come back to that. Um, it, in a sense, what, we, what, what I want you to not do is think of it as if the temperatures are stratified. It's not like as you go higher, the temperature goes up. Something else happens, and that something else is illustrated in this figure. This is a figure where I'm showing the, the coronal emission from one particular set of iron, I, iron ions. Uh, most sensitive to temperatures around a million degrees. And you can see that this is a highly structured atmosphere. Underneath it, I'm blending in the magnetic field at the surface. So the, the, the strong yellow, which is an unfortunate choice, and the strong blue is where the strongest magnetic fields come through the surface. So there's one region there. That's where that big sunspot was on the screen. But there are many others. Now, what you see is that where there's a strong magnetic bipole, you get these loop-like structures. We call them corona loops. Basically what happens is the material is tied to the magnetic field. It can only move along the magnetic field. So as you heat something, and that's what the magnetic field also does, it heats it, and as it heats, the material evaporates from the surface into the outermost atmosphere, fills those loop-like structures, and it outlines, literally, the magnetic field for us. The heating rates change over time and depend on position. So whereas you see individual loops here, the space that doesn't light up isn't necessarily empty. It may just be glowing at a different temperature, or it may have a different density. That's why we'd like to see this image at all these different wavelengths. And then we combine them into a composite image that shows us the full behavior of the atmosphere. I'll show you a number of those. But in the end, it all comes back to that surface, magnetic field. The magnetic field is generated in the interior. It comes through the surface. And it's very dynamic. Uh, the smallest scales that you see here are sort of Earth-sized. Uh, they change and overturn and disappear in a matter of a day. The large sunspot might live for a week, maybe a month, if it's a really large one. So it's very different from the Earth's magnetic field. It's continually overturning. There's no fixed feature in this landscape. The difficulty we have is that although we can measure the magnetic field at the surface, because the magnetic field, as light comes through it, changes the polarization, and we can measure the polarization, and we can guess what the field is, the layers above it are completely transparent. So we don't have a signature for the magnetic field. So that's where the computer comes in. We say, well, if we make assumptions about what the magnetic field should do, we can make a rendering of what the magnetic field looks like. And this is where the big puzzle comes in. And I'll come back to that a number of times, because it's easy to assume that this is a non-current carrying magnetic field, like the Earth's magnetic field is out in the atmosphere. There's hardly any currents running through the atmosphere here. Um, but whenever there are strong currents running through the solar atmosphere is where the fun is. So bear with me on that one. I'll come back to that. Now, going back to what the sun really is, it's one big ball of gas in the core of which there are nuclear reactions that generate all of the light. And for about 70% of the radius, 
It's a, it's a little, it's about a third of the total volume. Energy travels as light. It travels as photons that scatter off the material and they sometimes turn into a thermal energy of a, of a particle and then come back out as a photon. But they basically are light leaking out. It's at the outermost layers, just 2% just two percent of the mass, although it's 30% by radius, that something happens. That At that point, at the bottom of it, the temperatures are so low that the material recaptures some of its electrons, and the result of that is it becomes a little more opaque. And as it becomes a little more opaque, light doesn't travel so efficiently anymore. Something else starts, and that's boiling motions. There's overturning motions of the gas. They ri Bubbles rise to the surface and sink down to the bottom again. It's that set of motion, convective motions, that carry the energy that are the reason why the sun has a magnetic field. If you combine that convective motion with spinning of the star, you've basically done what the Earth does. You have convective motions in the interior in a rotating sphere, it generates a magnetic field. Anybody in the, in the universe does it that way. So are, are these uh, material motions uh, just thermal properties, or are there photon pressure of a sizable part of this? This is essentially driven by the fact that there's a surface to the sun. At the surface, radiation leaks out. That's the light that shines outside here that keeps us warm. As that radiation leaks out, material cools and begins to sink. It just falls back down inside. And because it falls back down, something else comes up in its place that's still warm and glows again. So it's really, it's thermal. You have a hot plate at the bottom and a pretty effectively cooling plate at the top, and you get these overturning motions in between. It's, I always like to think of it as miso soup. This is the pr best example that I know of. Because if you look at it, you can see these bubble patterns just form if it's hard enough. You look at it. It's a good experiment to do. With one difference, that's an easy fluid. It's water. It's not compressible. This is a compressible fluid, which means that the pressure at the top and the pressure at the bottom, or the density at the top and the density at the bottom, differ by factors of thousands. And that's what makes it so difficult to do in a computer, because it's really tough to do that kind of an experiment. So. 400 years ago, someone in my, my country uh, invented a telescope. And people around Europe, including Galileo uh, Galilei, pointed the telescope at the sun and saw these maculae spots on their surface. And he made a whole series of drawings that still exist. And we can see from that two things immediately. One is they change from day to day. In fact, it, it, that immediately showed that the sun rotates. And you can measure the rotation period of the sun by looking at that. The second is they change from day to day, which is, as I said, every spot is, associated, is the magnetic field, in fact, uh, that comes through the solar surface. And it changes from day to day. So we've known this for 400 years. We've known that they are magnetic for only about a century. When George Ellery Hale down in Southern California for the first time measured the signature profiles of magnetic field on light coming from the sun. We've only known how that stuff actually manages to affect us here on Earth since about 1970, when the Skylab instrument started looking at the sun and the sky around it and saw what it was that came towards us. We now know these things as explosions that are coronal mass ejections. And it's only in the last 10 years that we've really had a good enough look at the sun that we understand en enough of it that we can piece together a complete picture. So although we've known about aurorae for millennia, the cause of it and how it all works really is a work in progress that's been accelerated into the last decade since we have technologies that are on the ground and in space really showing us what happens not just on the sun but also on stars. The common property, this is one of these diagrams on the left that astronomers like to make, on the right is the easy one to look at. The common property, if there is a convective layer underneath the surface of the sun, of the star, it does what the sun does. And the more rapidly it rotates, the stronger the magnetic field is, the, the more pronounced it, its activity is. And the common property in this stellar diagram is essentially any star that's yellow or orange or red, the cool side of the diagram, has this magnetic activity. The heavy ones, the blue and white uh, stars uh, in the sky, don't do it, at least not during their mature phases. They did it when they were really young, and they'll do it again when they're really old but not during the bulk of their lifetime. But every star that's yellow, red, or orange does this. And the way that these stars evolve 
I'll ask you to look at the diagram on the right because that's intuitively the easiest to look at. It basically shows you as a function of age how bright a star is. And the sun, over the first four and a half billion years of its lifetime, has very gradually been increasing in brightness for about, by about 30% since it was born. By about 30% since single cell life existed on this planet. By only about 10% since multi-celled life existed on this planet, and by hardly anything at all since we've been on this planet. As far as we're concerned, the early man saw exactly the same sun as the one we're looking at. It'll change four and a half billion years from now, as the sun keeps gradually getting brighter, it'll suddenly come really suddenly in astrophysical terms. This is millions of years, but <laughs> we have to get out of the way if we're still around by then, because it'll get so bright that if it doesn't swell up to, to literally gobble up the Earth, it'll at least melt everything on its surface. But that's a long way from now. And there are many other obstacles, both uh, natural in the continuing brightness of the sun and political that we'll have to deal with before we get there. Um, the, the main point of this diagram is if you look at all these stars at different masses, the sun and stars like it, a little less massive and a little more massive. So from tenths of a solar mass to a few times, maybe one and a half times the solar mass they all do the same thing. They will all have magnetic activity all during their life. That means that we can actually look at stars and learn about the sun, because we can't look at the sun four billion years ago, but we can look at a star that's only ha half a billion years old, four billion years ago in solar terms. And this is the funny thing, that, again, this is a tough diagram to look at, but it's an easy one to understand. It basically says, if I make a diagram in which I compare the brightness of that X-ray bright corona versus the signature of the cooler 10,000 degree uh, material that sits underneath it, they all line up on these diagrams. So all these stars from, this is a big cool giant, Aldebaran, down to that little dot there is the sun, and even smaller stars. All of them line up on this diagram. So what's happened here? It basically says, if you put a magnetic field into a, into a stellar atmosphere, all you need to know is how much field you put in, and the star will figure out how to distribute it over the atmosphere in exactly the same way from all stars. So that's a nice way of saying, we have hundreds of thousands of other suns to look at to understand what ours is doing. And vice versa, what we are studying on ours is a good guide to what other stars are doing in the universe. And it includes really oddballs. Uh, some stars are buying, most stars, every second star that looks like an object that looks like a star in the sky is actually a binary. Some stars, some of these binaries are so close together that they basically touch, they have a common envelope. Some of these stars spin so fast that they're literally turned into almost like an oblate sphere. They, they, they have so much acceleration at their equator, they're no longer spheres. And yet they all line up on that same diagram. It's great. It's a wonderful set of stars to look at. The only thing that changes over time, really, is how fast they spin. And you can see this in a diagram like this. It says, how fast do they spin as a function of color? This is, this is the whitish star, the yellow star, the orange star, and the red star. The temperature associated with them changes here. If you look at the stars that are of order 50 million years old, they are, they're all over the place. If you look at them a few million years later, different group of stars, but effectively they're the same objects, they've slowed down a little bit. Look at a few hundred million years, they've now slowed down into a, a, nicely, a nice pattern here, and the sun at four and a half billion years has slowed down even more. So every star starts at the top, very fast spinner, and slows down. That's how they travel through this diagram that I was showing you. It starts a hundred thousand times brighter in x-rays when it's really young, and it just travels gradually down along these diagrams as it ages. And the reason it does that is because it blows a wind. And because it blows a wind, it couples to all the planets. That's what drives space weather. Now this wind blows off the surface of the sun, off the top of its atmosphere, the top of the corona, the hot atmosphere. And it's highly variable. And it carries within it a magnetic field. And because it does those two things, it blows and it carries a magnetic field, it leaks rotational energy from the star. Over time, that means the star is ever slower and slower and slower. And as it slows down, the number of sunspots, star spots goes down, the number of flares goes down, probably their, intensity, their average intensity goes down, and it becomes an ever more inactive star. 
Now, even the sun, after four and a half billion years, hasn't gone completely inactive, obviously. It's still there, it still flares. But if we look at stars that are its peers, very young, it c they can generate flares and coronal mass ejections that are a thousand times more energetic, and they do this a few times a day instead of once every 11 years. So it's really the frequency and intensity that's gone down. The basics of it, we think, is the same. Now, we've had that picture of sunspots doing something for 400 years, as I said. The first flare ever recorded was in 1859. You can go to the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society and find two papers back to back. Often this is the, the 1859 event. The first flare seen, they said, Richard Carrington saw this event. Well, actually, <coughs> Carrington did see it. And nobody around to share it with. They're like, I need to find an independent observer here because this I've never seen before. What is that? So he ran out, found somebody to come look at his observations, and, and it had actually dimmed by so much it wasn't particularly spectacular anymore. Fortunately, on the other side of London, uh, Richard Hodgson was also looking. And although Carrington was the more vocal one, these two papers are published back to back in the, in the, uh, in the proceedings of the, of the Royal Astronomical Society. And you can look them up. It's quite an interesting description, first flare ever seen. Now we see them routinely. We have wonderful equipment up in space to look at them all the time. And in fact, we have stuff in space that looks down on the Earth. And you can see here, this is the aurora. This is the, this is the signature of the solar wind coupling into the Earth's magnetic field. And if you look at it, as, as, I, as we do here, from the International Space Station orbiting, you can see three things. It changes pretty rapidly. It's a pretty extended thing. It's, it literally circles the globe and the northern uh, high latitudes and in the southern high latitudes. And you can see that it actually hovers above the atmosphere. It's the topmost atmosphere that these particles are hitting. The particles can't get any further. But the signatures of the magnetic field in the solar wind swinging by the Earth can. And that's what introduces uh, geomagnetically induced currents in corrosion of pipelines. Um, it can couple into the electric power grid and cause outages. Transformers can melt. Bad things can happen and sometimes do happen. Fortunately, not very often. But it's one of the other reasons why we're interested in all of this, because the sun drives all that activity. And of course, there are things above this zone too, this space station itself, with the astronauts in it, with other satellites, lots and lots of satellites, several hundred billion dollars worth of assets floating in space, and a lot of our economy driven by functioning satellites. They do fail occasionally because associated with those uh, geomagnetic storms, the magnetic storms, are energetic particle storms, particles that travel pretty much at the speed of light. They go through everything. They go through the central processing units on satellites and can knock them out, either permanently or just single event upsets that make services get interrupted. So all of these aspects somehow have something to do with the beginning, the sun. Now. Now I'm going to go back to the sun. As I said, below the surface of the sun is something we can draw wonderful pictures of. This is one of these animations that shows you how the magnetic field is being generated in the sun. You have to understand, we don't understand this. <laughs> we can draw a picture. We cannot, we do not, we, we know the ingredients, also helped by the fact that we look at other stars. We need to have a spinning star with this convective envelope. <coughs> but why the sun is as active as it is on average, why it has an 11-year cycle, or how we can forecast what the next 11-year cycle will do is still way beyond our means. We can't do it in the computer. We certainly can't do it on a piece of paper. What we're trying to do is find the patterns in the sun, find the patterns of tens of thousands of other stars, get ever more com powerful computers, and hopefully in the end, we can understand why that happens. The part that we can see, obviously, is the easier part, in a sense, because we can see it. The magnetic field that's being generated inside the sun bubbles up. It's basically a bundle of field that comes, breaches through the surface. And as it breaches in the process of going up, it has to fight these convective motions. So it's shredded to pieces. It comes up in, as sort of a spaghetti bundle that eventually sorts itself out into two polarities, one positive and negative, or north and south, each of which can be associated with sunspots. And if you look at that process in just the magnetic field signature, so the white is the north polar and the black is the south polar field, then as it repeats, you can see this field come up here completely shredded, but eventually it sorts itself out into black and white. All the black goes in one side, all the white goes in the other side. And it forms these arcs 
in the high atmosphere that are going to be driving the corona and all of its variability. Is this an actual observation? Yes. Simulation? This is the computer simulation. That was an observation. This is the simulation, and I wanted to show you that we can actually do this. This is a tremendously complicated uh, simulation because what you have to do is simulate something that's many, many times the size of the Earth. Um, that's sort of the size of the Earth, it's slightly off. But we have to bring magnetic field through the surface. That surface has all that cooling going on and the overturning that's in the computer, and then you introduce magnetic fields into it. But we're getting that part. We're getting close. So for good segments of the sun and much of the atmosphere near the surface, our computer models are pretty powerful. Extending that into the global model you need to get the total sunspot cycle simulated is a leap that's a bit away. I don't know when that will happen. That magnetic field comes to the surface on a great range of scales. It comes on this, onto the surface in bundles as small as we can observe, sort of the size of the peninsula here. And it comes up many times larger than the Earth's, sort of the Earth's moon system size. So you see these huge dipolar regions with big sunspots in them and all that pepper and salt down here. It's that large scale stuff that is subject to the 11 year cycle. The small scale stuff sits there like it's always there. We think it's actually been there all the way back into the, the, the famous period when all of the sunspots essentially disappeared, the Maunder minimum in, in the 1600s. So there too we have to understand the pieces. Like why does the global dynamo cycle and why does the local process, this pepper and salt stuff that you see not cycle, all of that is part of the big puzzle that we need to understand. Um, I'm going to skip a few to get to this phase. Three years ago we launched the Solar Dynamics Observatory and, and our group built two of the main instruments of it, one of which is the one on top here. Uh, the Atmospheric Imaging Assembly. And the Atmospheric Imaging Assembly made a tremendous change to us for several reasons. One is it was looking at the sun all the time. The two is it saw all of the sun, at least all of the front side of the, the earth-facing side of the sun. And it looked at it at a whole range of temperatures and pretty fast. It takes one 16 megapixel image every second it observes 10 different colors. It brings down two terabytes of data every day, and that's an awful lot of data, uh, so that we can composite these individual colors back into something like this. Our brain can't, and our, and our projectors can't pro produce more than, can't process more than three colors in a composite. So although we have 10 channels, we typically make them in three color composites. This is the solar corona as we now see it. So we see the sun as a slowly rotating sphere, we see regions that are dark and bright, that are dense and not so dense, sorry, not dense and dense. The, den the denser it is, the brighter it gets. And we see the sun in color. Now, that sounds easier than it is in reality. Of course, we can make color pictures. But in this particular kind of color picture, the color actually tells us about the main temperatures that occur in any line of sight that we see it through. Because of course you have to remember that this, this part of the atmosphere of the sun is completely transparent. So we see everything that glows that's in the way along a line of sight. So you get lots of temperatures and lots of magnetic field configurations in a line of sight. And yet you can, you can, un, you can see from this there are regions that are bright white. That means it has all temperatures. There are yellow greenish that's sort of a million and a half that are blue that are one million sometimes when something explodes it's, it goes into the red and it gets hotter the reason this made the big change is that usually a solar high resolution instrument points at a region on the sun and it points there because an astronomer says that's an interesting region is going to do something now most of the time by the time that that pointing gets implemented it's already done it or it's in the way it's done it. So we don't know what happened before. You, then it becomes night, so you, you don't see how it ends. You don't see the entire context. This is the big change. We see what happens all the time. We see an event, we go back in the archive. We literally observe the archive. We don't observe the sun anymore. And that's the strength of it. So we can start doing ensemble studies. We can, we can put the sun in the laboratory and say, that looks like something I've seen before. Let me compare it, because we've got that data too. So hopefully this instrument will keep looking at the sun for quite a long time to come. What it shows is in detail, if we just look at one channel at a time, are explosions like this. This was
uh, these are big explosions that are causing the coronal mass ejection, the beginning of it, of the explosion going into the space between the Sun and the Earth. And some of these explosions, a large class flare, <coughs> is something like a hundred billion Nagasaki bombs going off at the same time. What, the only thing that saves us is the distance. The Sun is, a pr is pretty far away. And yet these explosions do sometimes send enough our way that we still have to think about being careful. Uh, our atmosphere is about a kilogram of material between us and space, so it stops particles pretty effectively. But if you don't have that atmosphere, if you're not sh shielded by the Earth's magnetic field, it can be a dangerous environment. So for, for astronauts going to the moon or for satellites in high Earth orbits, it does pose a danger. Ah, I'm sorry. Uh, the Earth is probably sort of the dot on the eye. There's a million Earths in the Sun. There's a hundred Earths on its on their side to span the diameter of the Sun. Right. Is it is an astronomical object. Um, we have views not only from Earth's side, but since we've launched the stereo spacecraft a number of years ago they are now looking at the backside of the Sun. So for the very first time, humanity has a view of, a st of an entire star. We look at this thing from all sides, and we'll do that from February of 2011 until May 2019, when they will have drifted back to the front side, and then we're all looking at the front again. But at least for that period of eight years, we'll see the full Sun. We'll see what happens on the front and on the back. Do you expect to see anything surprising looking around on the backside? We don't expect to see anything surprising, but in many cases, particularly the, the, the largest active regions, they evolve on a time scale that takes several weeks, three to five, seven, six weeks. And the sun rotates once every month. So we've never been able to see the complete evolution. So we're hoping to be able to follow the complete evolution. It also means that anything that's headed, any explosion that's headed towards Earth, an instrument that's at Earth has difficulty understanding what's heading towards it. It can't really, see, it sees something, but it can't figure out what it is and how fast it's moving. But if you look at it from the side, you suddenly have that full resolution. You see how fast it's moving, you see the details of the structure that are going to hit you. So it, that too has made a big difference. And this is an example of what you can do then. This is one of these big eruptions, big explosion, that in most cases we see that material fly off the sun. In this case, it sort of stalled and most of it fell back. And we could see that with our uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory. But if you look at it from the sides, with the stereo behind and the stereo ahead spacecraft, I cut off most of the images. It does record full images, but I just wanted to show them larger here. It's hard enough to show this. All of these pictures are four megapixels each, um, and this screen does not do that. So uh, pardon me, I've compressed all these images into what look like low resolution, but we can zoom in and pan at the regions of interest. But this means that not only can we see that something exploded, but by combining these images, even though the stereo spacecraft run at a lower cadence, we can actually map the trajectory. We know in which direction it was falling and how it falls back onto the Earth, and in which direction it's moving off the Sun. So we have a real 3D, a stereoscopic 3D, uh, triple-scopic uh, set of uh, observations we can make of the Sun. And we look at the Sun with all of those instruments, and we look at the Sun to try and understand how all these signatures go towards the Earth. So we have an observer, we're building an observatory that really is not a series of individual spacecrafts, but that together sample this vast space all the way from the Sun to the Earth. And yet, we have a problem. So now I'm getting it to the second part of the talk. What, what's new here? We have a lot of data that we share with everybody. We have views of the global Sun. We have computers that give us models that are tremendous in their detail. And yet we have a problem. If we look at what we'd like to do, claim understanding, one way to understand something is say, I can, I can forecast what's going to happen given these conditions. Well, this is a diagram that was made by the, the then uh, director of the Space Weather Prediction Center, who said, how well can we now cast, forecast short term, forecast long term? You'd like this to be green. Most of it is yellow or red. Most of it is not nearly adequate or just not possible. So why is that? We have all these instruments looking. And this diagram was made five, six years ago, um, but it's still valid. So why is that? Well, I'm going to argue with you that 
it's not enough to see part of the sun. It's not enough to see the sun now and say what will happen in the future. We have to see the full sun and we have to understand what happened before. It's, a, it's an issue of hysteresis, buildup of stresses into the system. And in a sense, it's like trying to understand these sand dunes. And just give you that as an analogy. It's easy to understand how these sand dunes form, except if you go there on a day that the wind is blowing from the not normal direction. Because then you go, how can, this, how can sand dunes like this form if the wind is blowing at an angle to them? Well, you've not looked at the right time. You don't know the statistics of the wind distribution or where the, the storms were strongest in forming this particular pattern. And that, I think, is part of the problem with the sun. That when we look at the sun, I'm going to skip this one and go here. When we look at the sun, we can see big explosions go off. The big explosion are somewhat akin to lightning. They're big electrical currents that run through the atmosphere of the sun that become unstable. They can't maintain themselves. They're blown out into the space away from the sun. And the residual of that is, well, that means that the corona, the sun's state, has changed. So if we look at the, the loops, this is a negative image to show them a little better. These loops that outline the magnetic field before a big eruption and after big eruptions have actually changed in configuration. We can use the computer to model those structures and say, well, that looks about right. And if we look at this, you can see this has really changed. These structures are no longer here. Well, there's a few, but not nearly as many. And the color tells you where the currents are running. When they're yellow, they don't carry strong currents. When they're blue or red, they carry currents of opposite directions, red or, green or blue. So a lot of the electrical currents have been blown out of this. That's one of the things that we try to understand. This is a really tough problem. Our computers are having a really tough problem with it because we can measure the field only on the surface. And we're only now beginning to get the tools that allow us to combine those measurements with where we actually have the observed configuration of the magnetic field using the X-ray images and the extreme ultraviolet images. These currents, when they plow away from the sun into the heliosphere, the space around the sun, they basically have to break every single line of force, all the magnetic field that sits between them and space. So that's going to have an impact. And can we see that impact? Well, yes. I'm going to show you, I have to show you this before you can appreciate what I'm going to show you next. We could, we can now take a model. We can, we, there are computer models that are good enough to actually take a sphere that is the sun, put magnetic fields on it as we observe it, and compute the configuration of the field. Not dynamically, just what would it look like if I just let it relax, subject to all the forces that are acting on it. And you can see that there are these closed fields, and then there are fields that reach out away from the sun. That's, that's, those are the field lines that carry the solar wind away from the sun. We can do the next thing. We can say, what would it look like? If, if we took this at the time of an eclipse, what would it look like? Well, it would look like this. That is one snapshot. Because what this is doing is it looks like things are changing, but nothing is changing. All that this model does is it spins a fixed state for you. And it shows you how different that looks depending on the angle from which you're going to look. So it looks like things are evolving, but it's a fairly easy way. It's easy for you all here, if you look at this, to, to get that the system is rotating. Now, you might get confused into what direction because of the transparency issue. Sometimes it may go one way, and sometimes you think it goes the other way. But it really is a simple thing to look at. We can look at this, but now for the real sun roughly at the same pace. It's about a month running at the same rate. It's hard to guess that this thing is rotating. There's a lot of structure that changes. And if I slow this down by a factor of six, so that it's easier to look at, then what you're going to see is, this is, this is the, the sun. This is a disk that sits in front of the sun that keeps the sunlight out. So this is what you see is the the faint structure outside of the sun that you would see during an eclipse. But this is an artificial eclipse because somebody's held up a disk in front of the, of the sun itself. But you can see these big explosions rock through. There are three or four of these huge explosions happening every day. Now, what do we learn about this? There's a lot of variability going on. So what? Well, I'm going to do a trick. I'm going to say, let's take that circle there, which is a point at which most of the field is open into the space around it. So that's where the wind is flowing out. And let's assume I want to study how much these explosions rock that pattern. Well, what I can do is take the intensity along that clock angle and just stack them into a line. 
and do that for the next picture an hour later, and an hour later, and an hour later. So I make a diagram that has angle versus time. When I now uncover that picture, this looks like this. So each of these structures that you see bright here is one of these spikes sticking out from the sun going into interplanetary space. And you can see that they change with time. They change with time because the sun is rotating, so you don't always see the same one sticking through that circle that I drew. If it, if it rotates this way, you've got another pattern. But that's a slow change. It changes because the surface field is changing. There's a new sunspot region comes up. It twists the entire structure. But sometimes something else goes on. These big explosions are essentially these horizontal streaks. And suddenly something gets bright over a long angle as this explosion goes out. And now what you notice is this, that there's a structure before the explosion, then the explosion comes through, and then the structure's vanished. Another structure builds up somewhere else. There's another example of it, and another example of it. So what's the problem with this? You have a big explosion, you throw the current out, so the corona is going to reconfigure into another state. Yes, it does. There's nothing magical about that, except for the fact that the measurable field at the surface of the sun hasn't changed any, any more than we can measure with our instruments. So as far as our models are concerned, the time just before the explosion and the time just after the explosion have the same surface magnetic field. But the corona is different. And that can't be. The, the universe doesn't work that way. It means that we don't have enough information of, this, of the magnetic field at the surface of the sun, in part because we don't know what happens in the back, in part because we don't know how the currents running through the corona map from one place to another. And that's the problem. So if we want to get better at forecasting how a coronal mass ejection moves into space, or how, if that field is evolving, these particles moving at speed of light move along that field and might hit us wherever we are, um, we need to understand how we model this in more detail. And for that, we need more observations, unfortunately. But at least we now realize it's not just one state that we need to simulate. We need to have the history. Something changed from before to after that we also need to understand. We can do it somewhat in computers. And this is one of those cases where we say we can take a, comp a box in the computer. We can run electrical currents through an atmosphere that is much like the sun's. So here there are three of these electrical current wires, except that there are no wires in the sun. The field carries its own electrical currents. And if you put enough current on it, it goes unstable. It forms a coronal mass ejection. So this is the one that was forced to go unstable. The computer put a little more extra electrical current on that system, and it exploded. Then the other two exploded without them being touched by the computer. So what happened is that that explosion caused a distortion in the high magnetic field, and the distortion by the neighboring explosion caused other regions to explode. So the energy for the explosion still has to come up from below and be built up the way that we've always thought about it, but the reason it explodes may be because it becomes unstable or because something else becomes unstable. So it's a long-range coupling. Here's an example in the observations. If we look at the sun with this AIA instrument, I can go back in the archive and find you an example that looks like this. Here's a, a dark, at the beginning of this movie, it'll loop a number of times, is a dark structure that explodes. And as it explodes, it plows through the magnetic field. The magnetic field reforms after it. You see these glowing structures. That's the afterglow of the explosion. It has become a coronal mass ejection. Next to it sits another filament in much the same configuration as we just showed you, this filament. And after that explosion of the first, this one explodes. It's exactly the same configuration. So it's very likely that that second one exploded because the first one influenced it. It's a nice scenario. And now look at what happens here and what happens here. Simultaneously with that second explosion, there are two other major regions that go off pretty much at the same time. Is that chance? Or is that a physical coupling? Right now, our models can't tell us. We should be able to tell, because otherwise we can't understand why they go off. If you want to forecast something, you should know, is it important that something happened over there, or is it not important? Our models need to improve to be able to do that. And I'm going to do one more experiment with you. The sun has this annoying habit of spinning. If it didn't spin, it wouldn't be active. It would be not be fun. But because it does spin, it means that the front side of the sun
becomes the backside of the sun. It takes a month to rotate. Two weeks on the front, two weeks on the back. So when something comes up on the front, we know we can see it. When something comes up at the back, we can't. Well, we can now, sort of, with the stereo spacecraft. But the stereo spacecraft don't measure magnetic measuring devices. They measure imagers that study the atmosphere and the space around the sun. But they don't measure the field on the surface. So if we want to, to put the sun in a computer and say, here, this is what the sun did. Go figure out what the atmosphere would do. We have a problem, because we can only measure the front. And when the sun rotates back, when, when the sun rotates so that the back becomes the front again, we can say whether something has changed or not. But we don't know when it changed or how it changed in detail. So the time machine, essentially, that I'm building for you is this. I've unwrapped the sun onto just a, a general way that you look at a map. There's, there's, uh, longitude, there's longitude around the sun and latitude from the equators to the poles. And I've put the front of the sun in the middle. The front, at the front of the sun, we, we, we can measure the magnetic field pretty well. This is beyond the front. It's just over the edge at, on August 1st, 2010. I picked that date because it's been studied in great detail. And we know from looking at the sun a week later that new things emerged. New magnetic regions came to the surface we didn't know about when that part of the sun rotated and became invisible. We know sort of when they emerged because of the stereo observations, but we don't know the details. We don't know the strength and the magnitude, the orientation of it. So what we did was this. We said, well, let's keep everything the same and build ourselves a little experiment by changing what's in that red box from what we last saw to what it will be a week later when it rotates to the front. And then we can model the field and rock time, in a way, back and forth. From what does it do in the future to what, it did, what was it like in the past? That's not a guarantee that the sun changed that way. It just says, if things change, where, they, where we see changes is where they must have changed most strongly on the sun. Just in what order and how strong and how fast, we don't know. But when we do this, this is what happens. Now, there's a bunch of different colored field lines here. The black ones are the ones that would be bright loops on the sun. They start on the surface of the sun. They arc back to the surface of the sun. They're filled with hot plasma. They're filled with material that's a million or two or three million degrees. And you can see that most of these black field lines don't care what happens in the back. But some do. Some over this arc here are sliding back and forth because regions here that get new field and here that get new field, they'll come back and then you'll see them again coming up, actually steal connections from the region on the front. And most of those changes happen to be co uh, uh, concentrated on an arc that you can see run here. That arc is, is a magnetic tectonic plate. It's a divide. The field goes one way versus the other way. And it, the strongest changes happen on that particular divide. So now I'm going to take this entire set of field lines and project it onto the real sun. And when I do that, it's a still of the corona but I'm, I'm still showing you the field lines, except I've changed their color on you. Now they're white instead of black, uh, because it looks, it's hard to see black against the black sky. Um, and you can see that, that that magnetic divide is that red footprint here. And now you can ask, well, if I now compare that to what happened on the real sun, what do I see? Follow me through a number of things here. Start number one. Number one, there's a fairly sizable explosion that goes off. And then there's a dark, current st uh, filament structure that runs here that begins to take off. You can just see it going off here. It's a little bright in the room now. But, um, I don't know if we can make it slightly darker. And then, because this one becomes unstable, that's much better, thank you. Uh, this one, after it becomes unstable, and you can see it take off. These, by the way, are these two again that are similar to what I just showed you before, that one explodes and the other takes off before because of that first explosion. Now, now we have to loop through it again. Uh, it's going to start over with an explosion here, and that one takes off as there's a big eruption from this one. Same time. That's why they're both labeled two. Then this one takes off, and then there's an eruption from there that actually travels backwards away from the Earth. We can see that in the stereo spacecraft. So all of this activity on that day follows that magnetic tectonic divide, that red line, the quasi-separatrix, if you want the technical term. Um, and we think that there are two things that are happening. First, because of this configuration of these two filaments next to each other, one may trigger another, 
But all of that activity somehow has to do with the fact that there's new regions coming up on the far side of the sun that we haven't seen and we cannot see. So we cannot forecast this set of events because we don't know all the pieces. In order to do this better, we have to know more information on the back side of the sun. You can make it brighter again if you want to at this point. Now, one more thing I'm going to show you before I start wrapping up. This is the big explosion you saw before. Big explosion is located here, and it would, you would think that not too much has happened everywhere else. But this instrument is so sensitive that we can afford to throw away most of the information. We're saying, if we threw away what doesn't change and only show you what changes, this is what happens. So now you see basically the percentage change in the signal. This signal travels over an, an entire hemisphere, this explosion. And it's not the only one. I'm going to just show you a whole series of them now, just one after the other. So this is not real time. It's one after the other, just focused on these explosions. Look at how far these explosions travel. So no wonder things happen at a distance. This is, this is, this is I'm sorry, I shouldn't have pushed that button. Um, this is a million miles across. So it often goes the full radius of the sun or more. And you can see these blast waves run away and, and reach, and that's the explosion that becomes the coronal mass ejection. But no wonder that sometimes a region destabilizes because something far away happened. <laughs> Things here travel anywhere up to 1,000 kilometers a second. Fast. Most, uh, the average is probably about 400 kilometers a second. Are these the sound waves? We're trying to figure out what they are. Um, we, we would like to understand what they are. They're, they're, magnet, they're waves that run through a magnetized plasma, so they're combinations of magnetic waves and pressure waves, sound waves. Uh, it's, and they, and they diff, travel in different directions, sorry, different aspects of such coupled sound magnetic waves travel in different directions and different speeds depending on the direction of the field. This is, this is subject to modeling. I'm just showing you what, what it means. Now, even if you thought that that coupling wasn't important, you could have many cases, we've seen many cases where this happens. There's an explosion on the left eastern hemisphere and on the western hemisphere. Yes, we call them in different directions than you would normally do. This is also very annoying. But they happen at this, this is because of the way they're projected against the sky. That the eastern side is on the, towards the eastern side on Earth, but it's there. Um, these happen at the same time so much at the same time that we would have to invoke a propagation speed from one to the other that, ha that we don't have a process for. So these probably really are by chance. But if we looked at this from the point of view, just look back and now put, look at it from what happens to travel away, this is a combination of that same image that I just showed you, now with chronographic images of showing you against the, the, st the starry sky what travels away from the sun. These two happen at the same time this one, there's another third one actually here that comes out at the same time. That particular coronal mass ejection, if you were to try and understand that as a single explosion, you would fail because it's a tr at least a triplet explosion. So what does all that teach us? Well, it says yes, there are lots of these causally uh, linked eruptions. Not nearly as much as one might think, because in many cases they are really by chance. The sun is an awfully big thing and there are awfully many things happen by chance at this, about the same time. But we've seen different pathways by which they can happen. And the bigger the explosion is, the more important these couplings tend to be. So it's particularly the bad space weather that we really need to understand how the sun works as a whole. We also have now realized that, well, the sun, the solar atmosphere doesn't doesn't get subjected to an explosion and relaxes to some equilibrium state before the next one happens. They're so rapid in succession that the corona is still trying to relax from a previous explosion when the next one comes through. So computer models can't start with some relaxed state and assume that they're doing the right thing. They have to go through a series of explosions before they can say that the next one might be the complete model that you want to look at. Um, and, the, and the way to deal with this is to say we have to realize, well, we, we know by now it's 3D, uh, but we have to realize the new thing, namely that it is a large-scale thing, that it does couple almost globally, at least over an entire hemisphere, and that it's intrinsically dynamic. It isn't just evolving 
you have to know that it is evolving in order to understand what it'll do next. <coughs> I think there's a word that the National Research Council came up with in a, in a, in a medical context, and that's the word exposing. If you want to know what happens to someone in the medical history, you have to know what happened before. We're getting to the state that we now appreciate it. For the sun, we have to do the same thing. This explosion is different from the other explosion, not just because it's a different configuration, but because it happens in a different environment. So, to me, this means we don't see enough of the sun. <laughs> we have to see more of the sun to do this right. Uh, we have the, the near-Earth observatories. We're planning for missions that the Europeans are building, the solar orbiter, which is going to go close-ish to the sun and look at different latitudes by tilting its orbit. We're going to fly the NASA solar probe to near the sun. But if we want to make them successful, what we really ought to have um, is a view of at least the site that's going to come towards us so that we can put that into the computer before it actually is facing us. Um, we have to have a good view of whatever bubbles up from the surface because, as I said, we need to, in order to, cre to measure how much energy there is in something that's available for an explosion, we have to be able to model the magnetic configuration, which means we have to be able to see it so we can guide our models. And it'd be really nice if we had stereoscopic capabilities because then literal, like the brain has, <coughs> five to seven degrees of separation that we can interpret if we looked at it, that you can buy a television for if you wanted to look at it. Uh, because then we can measure which of these field, which of these arcs is in front of which, because that's the difficulty of a transparent medium. You have to get, guess the depth somehow. And none of that really is worth anything if we don't invest a lot in computers. So there's a vision of the future. Um, and if you want the vision of the present, by the way, there's a few websites that you can go to to look at all of these pretty images, including the sun 15 minutes ago. Thank you very much. Carl, if I could just kick off the questions. Um, you um, did a, you said Carrington uh, uh, lat uh, yes. longitude around the sun. Where, how did he choose zero degrees? He chose. So how do we... Yeah. Um, There's no fixed landscape. There's no fixed point on the sun. Uh, and in fact, the sun differ it rotates differentially. The equator, the surface near the equator rotates much faster than the high latitudes. So there's, there's, there, it's, a, it's a distorting coordinate system. Mm -hmm. He picked the mean latitude of where most sunspots occur as, as the average rotation speed. And, it, and our coordinates maps are locked to that system. But, it, but it's, a, it's a changing landscape. This is one of the difficulties we have. Someone writes a paper about an event on the sun, on the Earth, you say it happened at this place at this time. On the sun, we can say what time it happened but the place is much more ambiguous. So it's very hard to trace through literature where people have studied similar event, the same event, it, but just go by a different coordinate system. Very annoying. And, and is there any idea of, um, I'm presuming that you're showing us the very latest work um, on this, what you call a continental structure, how uh, long lived might such, that, such a structure might, how long lived could such a structure be? Uh, what kind uh, of you, the the um, you had a uh, the uh, a, a oh the dynamic yes uh, symmetric this um, is this is a field of uh, very active study that you were studying the topology of the field basically the the way that field maps from one site to another um, that too changes continually um, depending on the scale that you look at the patterns on the larger scale like you see here probably evolve on the time scale of a couple of days. It takes a new region to come up or a real big shift between regions before it fundamentally changes. Uh, if you go to the smallest scales, it matches, the, the time goes down with the scale. So, but, but in terms of what maps into the heliosphere and what's important to us here on Earth, knowing it on a time scale of days is enough, except when an explosion goes through it. That's the part I wasn't showing you. This, this was not a dynamically evolving structure. So, and since we have three or four explosions going through every day, it means that every, you're basically wrong most of the time, unless your model includes it. A very two-dimensional talk for a three-dimensional subject. So the question I have basically relates to, can you say a few words about your two singularities, the poles? And didn't we fly a mission, Ulysses, to look at the solar poles? We can't always fly what we'd like to fly. Um, the stereo spacecraft 
our wonderful spacecraft, they don't map the magnetic field. Ulysses was a wonderful experiment that flew over the poles but didn't have an imager on it. So we have to rectify that. Um, one pathway for the Ulysses-like missions is what the, the Europeans are now building in the solar orbit. They are going to send a spacecraft, probably launching in 2017, uh, that's going to use Venus as a gravity assist to gradually climb out to up to about 30 degrees out of the ecliptic. Can't do more. Venus isn't heavy enough to, to lift it more. But it means that the magnetic pole will be tilted in 30 degrees from its view. And, that, and it'll fly, obviously, once tilted. It'll see both the north and the south poles. Those are important because we don't really know the magnetic flow, the flow patterns under the surface. We don't know how important those patterns are to the rest of the dynamo because we can't see those patterns. Um, we can see a fair amount about the magnetic field. The trouble is that if we look at it from Earth, how am I going to do this without waving too many hands? There must be a sphere somewhere. Uh, <laughs> we don't have a sphere. Yes, I've got a tiny little sphere. <laughs> Imagine this is a sphere. If I look at it here, I look at it straight down through the atmosphere, and I can see a very deep layer. If I look at it here, the edge, I have to look through a much deeper atmosphere before I get to the same height, which means that effectively I can't. The depth from which that light comes is much higher in the atmosphere. So the field that we measure at the pole is at least a full pressure scale height, a factor of three or five different density than it is when we look at the, at the equator. And that's very confusing. We, we need to understand that. And one way to solve that problem is to fly out of the equator, too. So it's, it's both for helioseismology purposes and for magnetic field purposes. We'd really like to see the pole. So the poles are more quiet than we would almost expect it to be on the planet? No, not on the current sun. The sun, when it was young, seems to have had its spots mostly concentrated at the poles. When we look at young stars, their polar regions are covered with spots. Uh, we don't know how the, those dynamos do that either. But we see that signature very clearly. If, um, if you, given the uh, fields of view of these satellites, uh, how many satellites would you like to have around the sun to provide the uh, full global coverage? I mean, if, you had, if, if money was not no object. You can see half a sphere from any one point. But near the edges, it, you don't see it very well. Uh, if you want to see the full sun all the time, it will probably take five. I don't five. know if it takes five to make a difference. We have enough understanding of the way that the corona now works that we could answer that question by doing it in the computer. Just do a simulation of a dynamically evolving atmosphere and then pretend you had one point of view or two points of view or three points of view. How much more or less would you learn? Would you be able to reconstruct the model from those observations? It's at least two. I'd love to have three, because then we can see the entire activity belt. Mm. Not the poles, but the poles don't change very rapidly. Mm. And the sun does, because the Earth's orbit, the, sun, uh, the Earth's orbit is slightly inclined relative to the sun, so it looks like the, the sun is doing this from Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. So we see the poles every half year fairly OK. Mm -hmm. That might be enough. But this bit, we need to observe as much of as we can afford. And a second question is that a lot of the circulation that you've been showing in your movies uh, look rather suspiciously like uh, an old fusion project uh, from a generation ago called the Tokamak. And I was wondering if uh, the, uh, that device offers the possibility of like a, a tabletop uh, simulation of uh, plasma flow in, in, uh, in magnetics. It's hard to make a vacuum as good as the sun's atmosphere is. Um, the density in the corona is below that of the International Space Station in Earth orbit. There really is not much there. So that's one hard thing. The other hard thing is the, s the scale of the thing. It's right. a vast scale, so you'd have to find way. The processes in a tokamak would happen in, in, f in very small fractions of a second. Uh, and the, the question is, can you, can you actually measure fast enough to see what happens on the sun and, and translate it to that skill? But there are enough similarities in the, in the plasma physics and the fundamentals of the way that plasmas behave in their wave properties and the way that they accelerate individual particle populations preferentially relative to another, that they are highly complementary disciplines. Whether it's a direct translation, I don't know, but we are obviously communicating and we need to keep doing that. I think about a week ago there was an announcement that there was the discovery of a third Van Allen belt, uh, 
did I get that right? And, and what does what is it? And what does it mean? Are you able it's to an comment? excellent question for someone else. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's there are there are two long-lived radiation belts. One is primarily populated by electrons. The other is primarily populated by positively charged ions. They live for a long time. They can be disturbed strongly by geomagnetic storms. What seems to have happened is that there's a temporary filling of another belt, another region in space, by uh, a phenomenon that had passed through. But my understanding of it was something else then blew past the Earth, and that disrupted this newly discovered radiation belt. So it's probably a more transient phenomenon, as there must be in many other places. The, the particles don't really know where they are. They just are accelerated, particularly because of the way that the field evolves, because there is some wave that they happen to resonate with, or because of the way that they're filled from the outside. Um, that, but it, that is a discovery so new that it will take a while to really understand the dynamics of it. So in the practical um, example of doing some solar weather forecasting, you know, to help protect ourselves, um, an important thing is not only is there a coronal ejection aimed at us, but what the polarity of that ejection is. And I wonder if there's a way of detecting that, predicting it, you know, what are the challenges there? In principle, there is a way of predicting it. Uh, there's definitely a way of, of detecting it, uh, but we're detecting it from a point currently, uh, it, there's, a, there's a, a point in a rotating gravitational system where satellites can hover fairly stably, uh, one of the Lagrange points. It's about a million miles upstream. But at the speed that these things are traveling, that's only an hour. So we only get an hour worth warning of an actual measurement. And even then, that structure often is, is not quite directly aimed at us, so we don't quite know it. Modeling, understanding it all the way from the sun is in part, again, one of these derivatives of knowing more about the global field. I could have, one of the things I skipped is a simulation where someone has tried to do that kind of an eruption. They, they erupted a rope of which they knew the structure, and then they realized that as it was propagating through the rest of the surrounding magnetic field, it actually changed both in direction and, and intensity because of the way that it interacted with the surrounding field. So there too, the more information we know about the global field, this is the thing, anything that has to leave the sun senses the global field. The global field is the global field. It's determined by the largest scale patterns around the entire sun. So if we don't know that, we'll have difficulties feeding our models. When all this stuff arrives at the Earth, we call it solar wind. What is actually the composition of the solar wind in, let's say, the ratio of protons versus electrons? Will this always be strictly one-to-one, -one, or is there sometimes a dominance of one or the other? The wind is generally neutral. It's very hard to maintain uh, a charge separation in the wind moving around. Um, and it is mostly... Um, of solar composition, so it's, it really is hydrogen helium dominated with all the other trace elements in it. There are, there are conditions under which that changes by factors of two or three or four, uh, which are interesting and big enough for us to understand. And this has, must have something to do with where the eruption originated. The, 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 con the composition in the corona itself changes from location to location, de probably depending on the processes that provide the heat and the material that goes up. And when that blows out, you again have differences. Um, the, the, the energetic particle populations that aren't really the wind, but the, the particles that are preferentially accelerated to near light speed, they are sensitive to the, the charge and mass. Uh, so they probably pick up particular processes by which they get accelerated, but, and, and they can be very differently. Their composition can be quite different from the background solar wind, but the wind is pretty much solar composition blowing off neutrally from the sun. Uh, now may I suggest uh, solar sails to, to uh, you know, have a, a, a light pressure balancing out gravity and so you can place satellites at any location around the sun yep. in an inertial pattern. People have proposed them. We haven't yet, we haven't yet flown them large enough. Uh, successfully to actually make a big difference. Oh, how close can they be to the sun? Oh. How close could such a satellite operate to the sun? 
I can't answer that straight off. That but would, I, it's a balance between the heat input on the shield and, and the way that it leaves again, which is a, which is a balance of radiation and ele actually electrical currents on the gr on the conductive layers that might be on the thing because of the wind passing by. It. It's a very complicated problem. This, uh, not too close to the sun, but you can lift them out of the ecliptic. Yes. Um. Carl, uh, we have a special uh, Are We Alone mug uh, as a uh, memento of your great talk here. So please join me in thanking Carl for his great talk. Thank you. Talk.